Hi, and welcome back to the Illustrator Tutorials. I'm going to follow up in this video on using some of the skills that we used in video one and creating documents that are more directly relevant to uh, urban planners uh, using a lot of the same tools but just saying something different. Uh, it's going to be a three page exercise, and the first page is going to be a site plan. A site plan is the bread and butter document for planning. It, it's, um, it's something that you're going to be doing a lot of, and it's something that it's important to master in terms of content and work. Our sample that we're going to copy as closely as possible was something that was done for um, UIC some years ago by a private firm, a private consultant called uh, Booth Hansen, and it's really good in a lot of ways. It's clean, it's direct, it shows the right level of information for um, the audience and the purpose of the plan, and um, there's a lot to like about it. It's important uh, to study how existing uh, work looks so that your work can can be up to that level in terms of fit and finish, and also in terms of content and level of detail. We, you need to know what your drawing is going to end up looking like. If you're not experienced at this type of work and you jump in because you got to get it done, you just start drawing and then it comes out and sometimes you're pleasantly surprised, oftentimes you're not so pleasantly surprised, but you got it done. That, that's the main thing. But here, taking a little different approach. We're going to isolate just the software skills that we're trying to learn, which is only one component of any project. And we're, we're going to try, and uh, we have this visual picture and literal picture of what we want it to look like, and we're going to work from there and take the steps to get there. If you can have a, a clear visual picture of what you want it to look like and make your work look like it, well, that shows that you're exercising some control over your tools and you know what you're doing. So, as I said, the technology is just one component of a project. Um, from working with students, uh, both on their uh, final master's projects and the group projects over the years, I've come to believe that a lot of the trouble comes when pro problems in a project get conflated with each other. And when you have a, a collection of three, four, five interrelated problems, it's very hard to solve. If you can keep the problems separate and solve them individually, and that starts by recognizing what those problems are, you have a better chance of getting out of the weeds. So um, what are the components of a project? Well, there's the content, the actual message, what you're actually trying to say. Um, there's some level of artistic inspiration that, that guides us in ways that we're not always aware of. And then there are frequently technological issues um, in terms of learning software or uh, maybe uh, data needs to be scrubbed or you know uh, other other types of tech issues that come into play and when they combine and they all start going wrong it's really really hard to get out of the weeds so it is important that you work the right problem um, when you're when you're having problems with a project and uh, part of why we do this exercise in sort of uh, copying existing good work is so we can exercise just that component of our brain it's almost like uh, working out um, in the gym where you isolate one muscle group. So here we're isolating one component of, of the project creation and um, our skills are going to be directed towards strengthening that. Okay, so first let's take a quick look at um, what we're going to be doing in our exercise three. Uh, give this a quick read over. We can see the deliverable is three pages, a three page project. Here are the first two pages and these are the plans uh, created by Booth Hansen that I referenced. Um, then there's some other additional information, some, some tips about how to do each page, uh, some of the specifics, and here's page three. This is not by Booth Hansen. This is a, a view called a typical section, and this is actually some of my old uh, uh, mock work, um, but it's based on what your one type of uh, typical section that you're likely to see or employ. If we look more closely at page one, we'll take these one page at a time. Um, what What's really here? We know it's a site plan, but what is it composed of? Well, we see text, a lot of text. Text is very important to every document that we produce. It'll make or break a document. Um, uh, then a bunch of shapes. Many of the shapes are based on rectangles. I see a lot of squares and rectangles sometimes combined um, to make more complex shapes. Um, sometimes there's a couple of strange shapes here. 
Um, if you're familiar with UIC campus, you know BSB is a notoriously unusually shaped buildings, but an awful lot of rectangles. So my approach here is going to be to uh, sort of do the low-hanging fruit first, draw the rectangles and rectangular shapes that I can, and then I'll worry about the uh, unusual things last because there's so few of them. Notice that they're classed in different ways. Um, oh, and then we've got some green shapes as well. Uh, but as far as what uh, the buildings, they're either gray or orange or yellow. And um, the gray are existing buildings, yellow are future academic, and orange are um, some, some other uh, class. They seem to be like a, few, a combination of parking, facilities that are not um, academic, so we see some housing, as well as some uh, admin buildings. So sort of a third class that, that covers um, a few different types of uh, architectural uses. So uh, my goal is to recreate this as closely as possible. I want you to copy this. I want you to duplicate this as closely as possible. Um, how did they do this? Um, well, the typical way they do this is to um, find an aerial photograph of the area that you're studying and then trace over that. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to find an aerial photograph of this part of campus and then draw shapes over it, tracing, tracing the buildings as we see them on the aerial photograph. Then uh, once we get all our shapes drawn, um, we'll add the text. So um, let's give it a try. Okay, the first thing I need to do is to uh, bring up Google Earth and cut my aerial image. Uh, if you're not yet familiar with Google Earth, if maybe it's your first semester, you will be soon. Um, I got the hang of it just by doing stuff on it. Um, I'm sure you can find a, a LinkedIn Learning course on this. It wouldn't take long. It's an interesting tool. It's It's got a lot of um, functionality. It's still kind of maybe finding its way to some extent. Um, I use it mainly for just cutting um, aerial photos, but it certainly does a lot more than that. Um, but I find that that's what I use it more for the most part. There's a search function, if you see in the upper um, left-hand corner, if I search for USC, UIC, I'm fairly confident you will find it. And here we go. On my home machine, I do sometimes get some um, get some uh, video card uh, glitches uh, with this, so I may have to um, I may have to close and reopen. In fact, that's what I'm going to do. Time for a new computer. Uh, okay, so I reopened Google Earth, and you can see that the video is performing okay. Um, when you do a search, uh, you're left with some legacy um, text of what you searched. Going back to my um, table of contents here on the left, I'll go ahead and close that. Note the strange location of the close. It's on the bottom right. You don't really expect to see that on the upper part of a toolbar, but I'm going to close that and that's going to go away. If you look here at the lower left, these are the standard layers included with uh, Google Earth Pro. And uh, get the Pro. Uh, uh, it's the same for it's all free and you can uh, save images at a higher resolution with the Pro version of the software. All I really care for here is the aerial photograph. I don't want all this other text getting in the way. For the most part, that's how I always uh, export aerials from this. Um, I can turn everything off at one time by just deselecting the uh, primary database. Maybe I'm not sure where everything is. I might need my roads turned on so I can navigate. Um, so how much aerial do I need? Uh, well, if I look back at campus, you know, it's a little trickier if you're not familiar with campus, you can see we're bounded to the north by the Eisenhower Expressway, that's I-290. Shows, shows up to Cuppa here, north of the expressway. Then down south, where few of us ever go, um, I can see I need to include the ball fields and these two weird buildings that have courtyards in the middle. I don't even know what those are. So starting at the north, I think I've got enough there. I'm not really doing any site plan work here. If I've got the expressway, I'm in pretty good shape. Uh, going down to the south, I, I see here are the ball fields. And here are the two buildings with the weird uh, courtyards in there. So I think I'm in pretty good shape. One thing to take care when you're exporting images from Google Earth, if you search around a lot, what tends to happen is you can put your map in perspective. It's not what you want when you're cutting aerial images. I can put this thing in perspective. I'm holding the middle mouse button and dragging now. 
And it looks cool, but it doesn't help us when we're trying to do a site plan. What we want is no perspective. We want um, flat projected images. And um, you can get that through the controls here, but an easy shortcut is just R. Just type in R, one letter, and it'll bring you back to um, straight uh, aerial view, straight plan view. Plan view is more accurate than aerial view because if you were up there in a plane or a, or a hot air balloon, you would see perspective. Google Earth is not in perspective. It's a weird sort of um, composite of many, 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 many photographs and all of them shot from directly above and that's why it works. That's why stuff from Google Earth is more or less to scale because it's not shot from one single viewpoint. It's shot from many viewpoints and then stitched together as a uh, composite. So this is looking pretty good. I'm going to turn off everything. I'm going to turn off my roads so I don't have any clutter on this image. I'm going to type in R one more time just in case because I'm very... If you export an image and it's not in plan view and you start tracing over it, you're you're just going to be making a big mess. So make sure your aerial is in plan view. Type in the letter R. Uh, here, from here I'm going to go to the uh, pull down, file, save, image. That brings up a little mini menu up here and I'm ready to export. Um, under map options, I'm going to turn off all this stuff that I don't care for. Um, I do want to attribute my photo, but I don't want a big Google thing on it ever. Um, the attribution of where you get your aerial photos from and the date, um, that's something that should be in the fine print only. Uh, here on resolution, notice that I have uh, different options. No reason not to take the maximum resolution out of Google Earth. It's still fairly low resolution, at least at this distance it is. Um, so that's going to be as good as it gets. And then I'm going to hit the Save Image button. And uh, do name your files descriptively. So this is UPP458 Exercise 3, page 1, if I was really paying attention. Um, aerial Base. Uh, I might say Google because I do get aerial bases from different sources. Uh, the last thing I would put in this file name is the date of photography. I failed to note it before I started cutting this image and so it's not, um, it disappears from the save image. Uh, once you once you open the save image toolbar, the, that information disappears, uh, but I do want that in the image. So once I close the save image, um, I can see that the date of this imagery is 5-23-2018 and I do want that in the file name. Uh, trust me, the years go by and when someone looks at an aerial photograph, usually their first question is, when is that taken? Now I'm going to um, spin up Illustrator and get started on my um, work. Uh, I'll refer back to that um, assignment sheet for a second. Um, as it happens, um, the page one site plan is on 8.5 by 11. Page two will actually fit better on an 11 by 17 page. That's actually um, what it was designed for. You can see in my deliverables note, I'm telling you to be 8.5 by 11, but that's when we had to print this stuff. Since we're not doing any printing per se this semester, it's only going to be PDFs. Might as well do that one on 11 by 17. And on um, sheet three, that can be eight and a half by 11, but portrait. So we're going to have basically three different size slash orientations here. Um, you'll remember uh, left hand on the keyboard, right hand on the mouse, and our first shortcut, shortcut key is uh, control N uh, to bring up the new file dialog. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to, I'm going to plan on doing all three of those pages in this one file. So um, let's set this for um, eight and a half by 11 uh, landscape and I'm going to make three artboards right off right off the top just for the hell of it and this time we're not using any bleed we're not going to do any full bleed here so um, kick that back down to zero uh, the rest of this is okay and I'm going to say create okay here's our three pages um, let's talk a little bit about the different types of pages that we need. Um, let me go back to my um, reset the Essentials Classic workspace. So hopefully my 
desktop looks like your desktop. Um, so I said I needed an 8.5 by 11 landscape for page 1, that's here. I said I needed an 11 by 17 landscape for page 2. Uh, let's adjust that. The way you can do this, um, you can access that this information in a couple of ways. You can go into Document Setup and Edit Artboards. And here we can edit the parameters on each artboard separately. Uh, artboard 1 is selected. I'm going to select Artboard 2. You can see with my context sensitive menu, as soon as I do that, I've got some choices here. Um, what I'm interested in is the width and height. So I want this to be 11 by 17, so I'm going to change the width to 17 and the height to 11. I'm just going to hit enter, and that is an 11 by 17 artboard. And um, this is the artboard, but it's also kind of just a rectangle. I can scooch this around. Maybe I don't want them too close to each other. Um, where is this in space? Zero, zero is the upper left-hand corner of artboard one. Um, I can see that artboard 2 has the coordinates at the upper right-hand corner of x value of 12.6182. Let's just make that an even 12. Actually, let's make that an even 14. I don't want them too close. And a y value of 0. So x is over um, 11 to 14. That's 12, 13, 14, 3 inches of separation. And they're in line at the top. Okay, that doesn't really maybe interest you, but that's what it is. While we're at it, let's select artboard 3. And all I really need to do is rotate this, but it doesn't work that way. So um, the width is going to be 8.5, and the height is going to be 11. And I'm just changing it to 8 and a half, it's still 8.5 by 11, but I'm changing the orientation. I'm going to drag this to put this in line um, with the rest of them. I don't want, I don't like them when they're, um, I don't like that orientation. Um, also. I go crazy when the, there's not rational numbers used in any of these constructions. So setting things down to ten thousandths of an inch is patently ridiculous. So I like to type in, keep everything in even numbers. So you notice that you have, you do have full precise control over all these sizes. You never need to eyeball anything in Illustrator if you don't want to when it comes to stuff like this. And uh, placement on a page and margins and that kind of stuff can all be done very exactly. So I've got my three pages um, to get out of this. I can just select my um, selection tool, and that puts me back in drawing space. Here's page one, page two, page three. Only one artboard can be current at a time. And usually if there's something on there, if you start editing it, that makes the artboard current. Anytime you can't find a command in Illustrator, you can find it in the window pull down. And notice that there's actually an artboard um, tool palette. With this, I can select which artboard I want to be current. It's not really a thing for us, but we can draw all across the space and in the, in the gray space and everything else. Um, but we can also, I think, edit them here and all the stuff that we were just doing, uh, you can access through the artboard uh, tool palette. Anytime you can't find a tool, assuming you know what it's called, you can find it from the window pull down. That's um, good to know. I use that a lot. All right, uh, we're drawing for real now, so let me set up some layers that I'll need for this. Let's think back to what our um, drawing is going to contain. Well, it's not shown on here, but we're going to need that base aerial image, and that's certainly going to want to be on its own layer. Then we have one, two, three kinds of buildings, and two kinds of green space, and some text. So I'm just going to bomb out a few layers just by hitting this Create um, New Layer button. And I'm going to go conceptually from bottom to top. Don't forget, layer order equals draw order. So a slow double click right over the layer name lets me rename it right where it is. And on the bottom is going to be my aerial base. If I accidentally double click off that layer name, it'll open up the Layer Options dialog. I can also rename here and also do some other things. We we'll call this layer green light. Why am I capitalizing? I don't need to capitalize here. Green light. I'm going to call my next layer green dark. This idea of creating layers with layer names that are modular from general to specific is something that um, serves me in AutoCAD. 
where I can arrange where, where layer order does not control draw order. And I'll often need to um, uh, see all the, for example, text layers or all the green layers or all the, you know, something layers. And if I were to name these or just find something alphabetically, and if I'm looking for all my green layers, more than likely I'd like to see them next to each other as opposed to my dark layers and light layers, if that makes any sense. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Um, now I have um, building gray. Building orange. And building yellow. Oh, what do you know? I just happened to <laughs> create the right number of layers. And then finally, I'll have uh, text. Text always on top, almost always on top. You never want your text to be overstruck by line work. With my aerial base current, I'm going to bring in my aerial photograph. And that's going to be my guide for drawing all my buildings and green spaces. A couple of ways you can do this. I can just, you can't see it because it's on my second monitor. But I can just drag and drop. I'm dragging from my second monitor. And it just comes right in at full size. And um, did you expect it to be the size of our artboard? <laughs> Not ever. Not ever. Uh, if it was tiny, that would be a problem. It being large is not a problem. In fact, I exported this at high resolution. I expect it to be uh, larger than my 8.5 by 11 um, artboard uh, because this is kind of a huge area and I exported it at high res. You're almost always okay grabbing an image and making it smaller just the way you know how already with the Windows bounding box. You see I selected it and it's got a bounding box. It's ready to be edited. I can rotate it. I can move it. I can uh, scale it. In Illustrator when you scale make sure you hold down shift. Shift maintains the aspect ratio. That's width to height height of a image. If I don't hold down shift, I can end up with something like that. Now, you probably won't end up with that, but it'll be very easy for you to end up with something like that. And I'm not sure if you can see that that's wrong because it doesn't look necessarily wrong unless you really know something about UIC campus or the Chicago grid. So um, take care that you hold down from now on. Your default is to hold down shift when you're resizing. And that's going to maintain the aspect ratio. Um, if you want to resize from the center instead of the opposite corner of where you're uh, dragging, hold down Alt. Remember, we have these modifier keys that we can layer. So if I hold down Alt Shift as I resize this, I'm resizing it. Shift maintains its, co its um, aspect ratio. And Alt does it from the center of the shape. Do it again. I made it too small. Shift Alt resizes from the center. By the way, that also works when you're drawing stuff. Let's say I was drawing rectangles. Rectangles are drawn from the corner that you start, unless you hold down Alt. Then they'll be drawn from the center. It's going to be something that's very useful, maybe, when we're drawing all these rectangles on our site plan. And if I want to draw a square from the center, hold down Shift. And that constrains the ratio and draws from the center. Very useful when you're drawing circles, which we won't be doing here. Because who would ever draw a circle from an opposing corner? You would almost always want to draw it from the center out. So I'm drawing the circle and I'm holding down Shift and Alt, two modifier keys, and that's how you draw a circle from the center. I didn't mean to go down this path, but since I'm here, um, I'm in the middle of drawing a circle. What if it's in the wrong place? It's like, oh, I meant to draw it someplace else on the page. Hold down the space bar. Now I'm holding down three keys. And you can move it in the middle of drawing it. So Alt, Shift, Spacebar, three modifier keys hold down at the, held down at the same time. And that's how you draw things quickly. That's how, that's how you get stuff done sort of um, efficiently. You, sure, you can redraw, you can draw it in the wrong place, then resize it, then move it. But imagine if you just start drawing anywhere and you can adjust on the fly and start drawing it uh, to the right size and right location right off the bat. I'm going to delete that. I didn't mean to really go down this rabbit hole. Um, this is approximately the right coverage, but I'm not really sure. But I don't care because this is not to scale. So what I, what I, in the back of my mind, what I know I can do is I can draw everything I need to draw, 
and then I can resize the entire page to make it fit nicely on my 8.5 by 11 paper. I don't need to get this dead on right off the bat. In fact, unless I'm really familiar with the architecture of UIC and the limits of campus, I probably won't. So I'm going to accept this position and I'm going to lock that layer so I don't accidentally scooch it. You've probably already discovered that it's very easy to accidentally scooch stuff. And uh, with, with this, I can uh, go ahead and start drawing my buildings. Now, because I know that my existing buildings um, are the only ones that I need this to trace from, right, I can go ahead and uh, start drawing my existing buildings. These yellow ones don't exist. These orange ones don't exist. So I can only draw, and actually this parking lot exists, I think it does. And this exists now too, doesn't it? I'm not sure. We'll find out. Uh, but certainly everything that's gray on here I know is existing campus, so I can get busy drawing that and get some work done. I'm not going to fully analyze that. Um, maybe you can see it already. When I draw a rectangle, let's make my uh, gray building current. I draw a rectangle. And um, control C to undo that. I'm in the rectangle command. I'm going to get these looking right off the bat how I want them to look. How do I want them to look? I want them to be gray with, heck, with no border, no, sorry, no stroke, and a drop shadow. Drop shadow we're going to add last. That's icing. Uh, but I'll make it right off the bat gray, sort of a medium gray. I'm going to start a little lighter. So, so I think I'll see it better on the page. And no outline. I'm in the middle of a rectangle command, and I just change that. So right from the start, I'll be drawing my shapes correctly. Um, what's my problem? I got a lot of rectangles to draw. I want to use that rectangle tool. I certainly don't want to have to rotate everything. You see it's out of skew with the Chicago grid. Well, it turns out, um, as you'll learn in GIS, if you're... Um, if you care about visuals, Chicago grid is not quite square to the page. It's about 1.25 degrees off. Let's check that. Let's see how out of square it is. You can, you can see here clearly that it's out of square. So what I want to do is rotate my um, aerial image. But the easier thing to do to check the rotation, uh, what, what is the difference, is I'm going to rotate this rectangle and um, confirm my 1.25 degrees. That's what I seem to remember from GIS. So with this rectangle selected, you go to Object, Transform, Rotate, and here is where the Preview button proves its use again. Um, I'm going to try 1.25, and I want to preview this, so one way to do it is to deselect and then reselect. And uh, don't let the bounding box fool you, that's pretty much it. It's about 1.25. I'm going to say OK. And that's pretty close. That's going to be close enough, as they say, for rock and roll. And um, I think we can live with that. Yeah, so that's pretty nice. And notice the campus is kind of square with itself, um, as most things that are built are hit this grid and they maintain that square. So it's 1.25. I'm going to delete that. I need to rotate my image 1.25 degrees. Actually, negative 1.25 degrees, right? Because I'm going the other way. Uh, so I'm going to unlock that, select the image, object, transform, rotate, and it remembers my values. And hopefully you can see that it's skewing it in the wrong direction. What I want is negative 1.25 degrees. And you don't have to preview and unpreview. You can just hit the tab button, and that'll kick you to um, showing it. And boy, that looks like too much, but I did measure it. So I'm going to say OK. I'm going to lock that again. Zoom, make my building gray layer current. Zoom in and make sure that I'm on target here. And yeah, that's good. I can work with that. Um, in uh, GIS, why did, I, why did I bother ever learning this? Well, actually, it makes things a lot easier when you're drawing anything to do with Chicago. Um, being 
uh, 1.25 degrees, that's a lot in coordinates. And um, it's enough so that on a map, the lines look jagged. And, uh, you know, we're always concerned with, with how stuff ends up looking. So I'd rather have my north arrow rotated 1.25 degrees, which you won't see, than every line on my map not square to the page, which you will see and which will cause trouble. So now I can just start tracing over these buildings. I've got my building gray current. And I'm good to go. And this is going to go fast. It doesn't have to be perfect. Building. Building. That's University Hall. That's just a building. I'll do all the easy ones first. Look at the quad. Uh, it's four squares. Should I hold down shift? Why not? Let's see if it's really square. It kind of is. And what I see here is that it's actually um, symmetrical. That tells me that there's a faster way than to draw each one separately and actually a better way. For example, I can, um, if I know these four are the same, I can copy this using Alt to copy and Shift to keep it perfectly in line. Now I can select both of these and Shift Alt drag and I can very quickly draw these. Now that's only slightly faster than, than drawing it four times, but it's perfect. These are perfectly in line and um, this, the symmetry is actually dead on. Um, what if I wanted to do it even uh, faster? I'm going to delete those two. Notice that I've got these other buildings here, these smaller um, sort of admin or, or the offices in them. I'm going to draw one of those. And now I'm going to reflect or mirror these three entities to create this on the south so that it's perfectly the same. So um, with the three selected, and remember, shift select is how you add or remove entities from a selection set. So I'm picking the first one, then I'm holding down shift and shift. Or you can do a window that gets all three of them. That's another way of doing it. I'm not concerned about messing up my aerial because that layer is locked. So with those three selected, I can go to Object, Transform, and Reflect. And here, Illustrator doesn't know if I want to reflect it to the left or right or up and down, right? Either horizontal or vertical. So it's got the preview selected, and it looks like nothing's happening, but that's because if we were to do a vertical reflection, it would be barely noticeable because it's not reflecting it to a different location. It's reflecting it right on top of itself. So when I select horizontal, notice that it's showing me where this is going to be reflected. Okay, It's still a little confusing because these are squares and it's, it's just a little weird, but just stay with me on this. But I want a horizontal. It's just that my axis is here. So what I need to do is reflect these, but don't say OK because that'll just reflect what I've drawn. But here you want to say copy, and that makes a reflected copy, and it's now selected. And now I'm going to drag this down as I hold down Shift. And that's how I would draw this array around the quad. I would draw one square, copy it, uh, draw one minor building, and then reflect these three down. And that's how you keep things nice and tight. Uh, ooh, here's a big old rectangle I need to draw. And this level of detail is going to be good enough for what we're doing, for the type of site plan we're doing. Let's look at another uh, uh, productivity tool, you might say. Look at these three lecture halls. Well, I'm pretty good with my pen tool now, so I could trace this like so, right? I could trace this shape, and if I'm careful, maybe holding down shift so I can get stuff right in line, um, I could get this pretty close. I'm going to type in V and delete and delete. But a much faster way to do this, and, and kind of better, is to, um, if it's part of a rectangle or can be expressed in rectangles, I'm going to draw it expressed in rectangles. So here's one, actually this is a square, and then here's a rectangle, 
and then here's another rectangle. And then these connecting hallways, I'm going to also express as rectangles. Okay, now that looks pretty good where we're at, but having uh, examined this a little more closely and knowing the tools, I can see we're right here, right? I can see that I'm going to be adding a drop shadow to this later. And a drop shadow is going to uh, reveal the construction um, in a way that I don't want. I want this to look like one shape. However, it's actually one, two, three, four, five shapes. I'm going to select them all, and I'm just going to give them a border so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, you see those borders? When I go to give this thing a drop shadow, I'm going to turn, just demonstrate this. I'm going to turn off my aerial, select these things, and go to Effect, Stylize, Drop Shadow. And um, at this point, I'm going to adjust the drop shadow slightly because you can see it's, it added a shadow, but it's way big and way loose, which means all my values here are too small. So let's try something very small. Excuse me, all my values here are too large. So let's try it at point 0.1 and see if that's closer. That's closer, but it's even still too loose. If I look at the if I look at the effect I'm going for, it's almost it's almost um, no fuzz. It's almost like a copy and uh, and no shadowy fuzz at all. Let's try that. Let's just try zeros and see how that looks. So x is the offset to the right, y is the offset down, and blur is how fuzzy it is. So that's um, all zeros, and of course we're not going to see anything. Now I'm going to try some very tiny offsets, 0.01 to the right, 0.01 down. That's kind of what I'm going for. That's, that's looking pretty good. In fact, I kind of like it better uh, than what they did on the sample, uh, because I don't like how I'm seeing these white spaces here uh, where, the, where they join up, or maybe they just drew their things too thin. Anyway. Um, You see the problem. It looks kind of cool, but it's making it's putting drop shadows where they don't belong. I'm going to accept that. I'm going to give this no stroke. And um, it's not that it doesn't look cool, but it looks wrong. It suggests that these are separate parts and so on. I need these five things to be one shape. It's actually really easy to do. And I can still do it, in fact. So I'm going to select those five things. The drop shadow is just an effect. I'm not actually selecting it. Um, it's something that's a result of the geometry. And now I'm going to look for something called the um, Pathfinder. I can't see it. I'm new to Illustrator. Um, I can always look on the window pull down and find Pathfinder. And Pathfinder allows me to join geometry in different ways. Oh my god, I don't know what any of this means. I'm just going to try some. So I'll try that one. Well, that didn't do it. That's okay. I can always control Z to undo. Well, let's try this one and see what I get. Well, I don't get anything. Let's try the second one. Well, that's kind of interesting. I might need that someday, but not right here. Let's try the first one. And that's exactly what I wanted. And I kind of knew which one it was, but I want to show you that my actual method when I didn't remember is just to try some stuff. And it took me longer to explain this than it would have taken me to draw this because it's actually really quick to draw simple things, join them, and then um, uh, come up with the finished shape, right? And this is, you can see the drop shadow is actually attached to it. I'm going to control Z, control Z, control Z. I didn't want to do that move. And um, that's how you draw these other complex shapes. I close Pathfinder, but I'm going to be using that a lot. I can use Pathfinder here on, I think this is ESL or ESO. I've got another similar three lecture halls here. I can use Pathfinder again there. I can use it all over the place. I can use Pathfinder here. These are more lecture halls. Um, so it's very, very useful. Don't do your drop shadows until the end. You want to do them all at once. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One. Um, they, t they slow you down. This is actually a raster effect, and um, because my values are zero, 
I don't have any, um, you can't see the pixelations, but this is pixels. We're in Illustrator. We don't want pixels. That's going to slow us down. And um, secondly, uh, you'll won't remember the values. And you'll have to key in the values again. And you want them all to be identical. So do that last. So that's just icing on the cake. You don't need to do that. Um, it's just going to slow you down. So I want to get rid of those. How do I get rid of it? Do not make the mistake of when you're trying to adjust a drop shadow, um, go back into the drop shadow command. What you're going to end up doing is putting a drop shadow on a drop shadow, and that's actually one of the few ways that's a really a good way to crash Illustrator. Illustrator is pretty stable, but if you start adding raster effects on raster effects, that's a pretty good way of crashing Illustrator. I've done it many times. So the way you want to actually do that is to adjust the appearance of it. And so appearance, oh my god, another command, another palette I need to learn. Well, that's okay. Uh, I know where I can find it if I can't find it, and that's in the um, window pull-down. So here's the appearance uh, palette. And um, this tells us everything that's going on with the selected geometry. So if I select this geometry, I can see the path stroke definition and fill definition, opacity. If I select this one, I see those same things, but I see a drop shadow. And if I wanted to adjust that drop shadow, I could select it here, and that's how I would adjust how the existing drop shadow looks. Maybe I do want a little blur on that, on that drop shadow, right? And now you can see how it's a raster effect. It's pixelated. Uh, maybe I just don't want it on. Uh, while I'm working. Or maybe, as in this case, I just want to delete it. And that's where you would delete or adjust the drop shadow. So don't go back to the command. Maybe it's just me. I used to do that all the time when I was learning. I'd go back to the command and end up just like um, making a colossal mess out of it. Okay, so that, these two commands, the rectangle command and the um, pathfinder command, are going to get you um, like 90, 99% of the way through the constructions you have to do. As for the green space, uh, I would draw that with the pen tool, right? And when things stop lining up exactly, bring that PDF off to the side and just sketch it in. It's all going to be rectangles or combinations of rectangles, so it's okay to go sort of off uh, you know, off off the reservation a little bit when things don't line up exactly. I'm tracing the existing buildings, so that's going to line up exactly, right? But uh, once you start getting into having to draw things that don't exist here, here's that parking lot I mentioned. Uh, you, you'll need to just, um, you know, use your artistic license a little bit. Okay, well that parking lot, as you may remember, was supposed to be what color? orange. So that means I drew it on the wrong layer. Now putting it on the orange layer, which you'll recall you do by selecting it and dragging it to the appropriate layer, selecting it and dragging that little icon to the appropriate layer, doesn't change anything except the color of the bounding box, right? You can see the color of this layer is magenta, whereas the color of my gray layer is blue. Um, all it changes is the color of the box. That's not going to give me an orange building. I still have to change uh, the fill color for that. Don't forget that. Um, okay, so last thing I want to look at is the pen tool and how to draw a complex shape like this. Before I start drawing though, I'm going to uh, select, I'm going to unlock and select the aerial base and kick its opacity down a little bit so you can see my line work a little more clearly. So looking at the footprint of this building, we can see that the level of detail involved is not really suitable for this type of site plan we're working on. If we were doing something that involved this particular building, maybe yes. If we look at the Booth Hansen plan, you can see that it's kind of approximated in. It's, it's a weird shape, but I don't know that it's exactly like that shape. You know, in fact, it's, it's really not. Um, and here's the thing about an irregular shape like this. It's irregular, but it's symmetrical. Can you imagine an axis running east and west? And you'll see the north half and the south half is really symmetrical. It's that symmetry that we're going to use to make a quick and dirty 
um, footprint look precise and the way that's going to happen is um, when you see something repeated it becomes not a mistake but a sort of a motif so we can um, by using that concept we'll draw half reflect it and when the two come together it'll look a lot tighter I'll show you what I mean the first thing I'm going to do I'm going to make it a layer other than the layer I'm drawing on which is building gray current and I just want to draw that axis in so I'm going to approximate the midpoint here on the right hold down shift to orthogonalize and there's the left midpoint and here's my axis uh, it's it's far too um, thick so let's make that a reasonable um, thickness for what we're uh, doing I'll just change the color to something that's less building like something I know it's not found in the plan cyan's a traditional guideline color and here the trick is I'm going to lock that layer this is a temporary line that I'm going to erase later but you can see it's locked I'm not going to accidentally scooch it I want to make my building gray layer current and using the pen tool I'm going to trace over this quickly this footprint but the trick is I'm going to make sure that my first and last points are snapping to this guideline I set up notice how when it's snapping you get a little um, indicator um, it says path and you can kind of feel it it's one of those magnetic things it snaps to it um, so uh, I'm gonna have to give it an outline color even though we're drawing these buildings properly with no outline with no stroke definition um, but if I don't have an outline I won't see what I'm drawing also no fill and if you start drawing with fill you'll see why that's a problem so now I'm just gonna snap that first line and just somewhat liberally um, bang through this I'm not gonna spend an hour on this um, even if I do it won't look good because it's so crazy there's so many little things that are, are impossible to draw so as long as I'm making something that's close and this is I'm actually drawing more detail it won't even be visible at the scale that we're working at but if you do something that's close um, we'll see what we get let's see how this looks and if you want it's not a bad idea when I'm drawing horizontals and verticals hold down shift and you don't have to be so careful and I'm gonna finish the path and just letter V for uh, to get back to my selection cursor so there's half of BSB I'm gonna select it and go to object transform reflect and now you start to see since since this shape is not symmetrical like the last time we tried to use this tool you can see a clear difference between um, <laughs> the reflection and the original in this case I want to do a horizontal um, reflection last time I think we did a vertical last time we did do a vertical and again instead of saying okay I'm gonna say copy and it's made a copy and the original still there notice the copy is selected I want to be careful that I can just now holding down shift pull this down and I'm gonna snap it right into place okay I'm gonna unlock my scratch layer and deselect that axis and I'll turn off the aerial for a second and notice how despite the fact that I kind of slopped it up it is convincing and that's because it's perfectly symmetrical now all I need to do is to um, join these two things together the way to do that is just select them both and control J is the shortcut for that and the reason I need to do that is so that I can fill the whole thing uh, actually I want this to look like this right and there's even a quicker way to do that I'm going to select the object that I want to edit and then I'm going to use this eyedropper tool and now anything I select it'll take on that look in terms of uh, fill and stroke so very easy to make something look like something else to to clone the properties of an entity okay so that's all there is to the to the pen tool and using what we know about symmetry 
it makes our sloppy buildings, our quickly drawn stuff, look a lot tighter. Okay, I'm not going to make you watch me draw every single building, but here's one more shortcut. What do you do when you have a donut? Well, what if I draw the inner one first and the outer one? Um, yeah, you see the problem. So how do we get something to look like a donut? Well, it's actually uh, pretty simple. It's just one command. You need to select both entities. And what we're going to do is make a what's called a compound path. With them selected, you can just right click and say make compound path. And the, the properties of a compound path are such that when you go to fill them, they fill uh, like this, like a donut, exactly what we're looking for. Okay, the last thing we're going to need on this page, I mean, we're going to need a whole lot more drawing, but I'm not going to uh, make you watch me draw the whole thing, is uh, some annotation. And if we look back at the um, sample, we can see that basically we've got two columns. Uh, they're both left justified, and they have these leaders coming off them. So the way to do this is to draw one of them with the leader, and then copy it down. That's, how, that's the best way to keep it in a perfectly straight line. And then we'll just adjust the endpoint of that leader so it's pointing to the right thing. Um, so I'll make my text layer current. I'm going to lock everything that's not text. There's a real tendency when you're zoomed in for things to get, I keep saying scooched, but things to get inadvertently moved. Um, and, and that's a problem, especially when you're zooming in a lot. So um, what else do I need to know about that text? How big is it? Well, if you've printed up a hard copy of this, um, you could measure it. Um, I think this text is pretty big. It's suitable for a slide. I'm going to guess it's about an 8.5 by 11. It's got to be like 12 point text, something in that range, 11 or 12 point text. We can see also that it's a sans serif typeface. It doesn't have the serifs on the letters, right? Those little things on the end of the verticals and the little horizontals that make it look like it's, uh, you know, uh, Roman pediment. Uh, engraving. So um, almost any uh, sans serif will do. If you um, are really getting into this, you can try and match this font exactly. Um, but I'm going to go with a sort of um, robust um, uh, sans serif and, and uh, be okay with that. So I invoked my text command. I'm going to start by, I'm going to use paragraph text in this case, you'll recall the difference paragraph text you click and drag a rectangle and um, the first one is CTA station with landscape bridge okay CTA station is it all caps I've forgotten already holy cow all caps uh, CTA station with landscape bridge um, actually my default font looks pretty close to what it is and it's amazing how often that's what they've used uh, but you know we have um, the ability to um, use lots of different typefaces I'm gonna go ahead and open up my uh, two key text windows for type and that is character and paragraph and if they don't uh, open like this uh, you can put them together so that they are tabbed like this. It's a good idea because you go back and forth with them. So let's see, uh, one of the sans serif fonts that I like is um, Helvetica. It's a very famous font. Maybe you remember from that trailer. And I'm going to go with a medium. Well, actually, no, I'm going to go with a light, even though their font looks more like a medium. So that might be a little, um, a little uh, light to try and match that other font. Um, but it's certainly in the ballpark. And now I need a, a leader. And a leader I'm going to make with a pen tool. I'm going to start middle of the beginning of the type, give it a little what's called a landing. There's a second point, and then the third point is going to be what it's pointing to. And this is the CTA overpass, and it's done right there. When I'm done, V to get back to my original cursor. And we can see that it took um, the default settings I had, uh, which was no stroke and black fill. That's pretty much the opposite of what we want. We want no fill, and we want a black stroke. When it comes to stroke, um, 
the rule of thumb that I go by is I want my leader to be the thickness of the um, text to which it's attached or thinner so you can see that my leader is a little fat uh, so what if we go down to like half a point that's more like it I don't want it drawing attention to itself right we can see that this is a little thinner than the um, lines that, that the text um, is formed by, formed by how big was this how big did I make this by the way 12 point okay we'll start there and see how it goes um, now I need my arrowhead please please don't go and draw little circles on the end of your lines what we want to do here is open this um, stroke panel and as always if you can't remember where it is it's under the window pull down uh, stroke it's there uh, I'm going to tear this off just so you can see it a little more clearly and here you see we can do things like make it a dashed line and control even the width of the dashes the sorry the length of the dashes or we can add arrowheads and this is set up such that we can add arrowheads to either the beginning or the end now you'll recall we started from the text so that's our first point and we ended um, with our second point where we want our arrowheads so does there happen to be a round arrowhead uh, what do you know arrow 21 gets us right there and yet more evidence that there, the original drawing was done in Illustrator okay um, this is looking actually pretty good and um, you know I'm thinking that's going to be just a little big at 12 I'm going to kick that down to 11 um, now um, where does this line up in terms of the PDF so it looks like this wants to be oh my and the landing distance is much longer so I got to adjust that as well so it looks like this wants to be just past um, the Dan Ryan here so let's let me see if I can't just right off the bat I'm going to select both of these things and um, using my arrow key which is sometimes I like to scooch things over using the arrow keys so I'm just hitting my left arrow key somewhere around there and I'm I'm discovering I need a longer landing on this so remember to go inside the geometry of anything we use the direct selection tool so using the direct selection I'm going to select the anchor point that I want to change and I'm just going to move that over I'm going to hold down shift so I move it perfectly in line and just refer back to my PDF and it's actually coming right down past the circle interchange like pack past by where Kappa is it's actually kind of kind of in the right place is it no it's off a little bit so um, here's Kappa here's Peoria right there's the overpass so I'm going to select that endpoint and move it to where it goes all right that's pretty much what we're looking at on that PDF right their landing pads a little longer I may find when I add these other ones that I'll need to adjust it uh, but first thing I want to do is get everything in get everything drawn in and then um, then I'll worry about uh, the exact placement so um, I'll select both of these entities and by now we are pretty straight on how to copy something shift alt drag copying it right down to um, perfectly in line shift keeps it perfectly vertical horizontal at 45 and alt drag is how we copy uh, here's a, a, a sort of a shortcut that's not always some people even the advanced users forget about this control D repeats the last edit command so I just hit control D a bunch of times and I can um, quickly copy it repeats the last edit command whatever that is so uh, you'll be surprised sometimes what, what the last edit command actually turned out to be when you invoke that command so right now if I was gonna finish this up I would put this on my other monitor and I'd start uh, first I'll type in all the um, text that I need to do right I'm gonna type up all the all the calls just as they are on the sample and then um, start to see how they fit into place how many do I have how, how many are on the sample is it looking like things are the right size um, is it looking like things are the right size now, I've never tell you the truth and then you won't be surprised to hear this I've never actually taken this project all the way so it looks like 
just looking at the page overall in general it looks like the circle interchange that's a, a couple of inches two four six eight that's almost a quarter of the page down that's maybe an inch and a half down from the top that's that's where the circle interchange should come in and then the closest thing to the bottom should be those two hollow buildings so it's looking like I might be a little up on the page all in all so what I'm going to do is um, go back to my layers I'm going to freeze that text and thaw everything else I'm doing a control a and I'm just going to move this down on the page I'm going to use my arrow keys I like using my arrow keys sometimes when I'm doing you know this like quasi precision um, work uh, like this I'm sort of like watching it go <laughs> anyway so I can see that those two donut hole buildings I uh, want to be closer to the bottom so something like that I'm going to lock everything and thaw my text do another control a and how I should have some margin at the top I'm almost positive of that yeah I got a probably a good half inch margin at the top and so now I'm going to move this down and that's getting a little closer to what the layout's going to look like right I think it is um, how about this base photo what are we going to do with that well if you can see on the sample someone drew in an illustrator they traced over the circle interchange if you want to work on your pen tool skills this would be a really good thing to trace over and I'm not telling you not to do it um, it would be it will be really useful and uh, only by repetition do we actually learn this stuff so that would be time well spent actually my guess however is that you don't have that kind of time so what we're going to do is use the um, base photo assuming that you're not going to have the time to do that so um, what we're going to want from this is for it to be quite a bit lighter and also black and white. This Google imagery always comes in with a whole lot of green and a whole lot of noise and it gets in the way. So we want something, we want to approach the subtlety of this background, which is very, very subtle indeed. And then we'll throw in some street labels too, or you'll throw in some street labels too. So here's something that I didn't mention when I first brought this in I dragged it in and dropped it if I select this placed image now let's look at the context sensitive line I want to point out one thing to you I have the option to embed it that means that it's not embedded now when something's embedded it means it becomes part of your illustrator file when something is not embedded as this is not embedded now because I only have the option to make it embedded this is a toggle right it's either embedded or unembedded um, whoops now I have to control Z to undo that um, the difference is that uh, when it's embedded it's part of your illustrator file when it's not embedded like the situation I have now it's in a separate file and every time I open this illustrator file it goes and looks for it it knows the location it's called a link I can open my link window and uh, this will tell me all the links in my drawing and here it is and it'll tell me the location right um, and uh, different metrics about that so it's not a part of this illustrator file and whether you embed or don't embed is for the most part a question of how you're working and what you want um, how you want your files to behave I frequently don't embed things because um, I might still be editing this in Photoshop or something and I want Illustrator to always open the latest version so a bulletproof way of doing it is to embed it and now it's part of this Illustrator file now for this exercise another positive aspect or another good reason to embed it is because now I can do some minor editing on this right within Illustrator now once you learn or once you um, know some Photoshop you'll find probably that you want to do most of your photo editing in Photoshop but um, it's it's I don't know it's a cute little idea that um, you can do some editing in Illustrator if it's not too simple and all I want to do is change this to a black and white I think it's edit edit colors here we go convert to grayscale 
like I said, I don't use it a lot. So that desaturates the color and uh, not the original of this that's still in a directory somewhere, but just this in the file. And I want to set the opacity on this way back because I want this to be a subtle thing. So um, there's a bit of an art to how far back you can do this. That's looking not bad. Um, this tells me that my gray buildings are probably all a little bit um, light because I'm, they're exactly the right color of the background, so I'm going to have to darken those up a little bit. Let's go just a little lighter. I like even numbers. Let's go to 15%. Well, it's not an even number, but you get the idea. Rational type number. Okay, that's giving me the hint. I can see the expressway curvature. I can see it, uh, some of the city grid. Uh, that's the minimum of what I think I would do on a page like this. It really would be nice to draw this up, but I get it. This is already going to be hours of work um, for most of you. So um, if you want a, a shortcut and not draw over this background, um, this is probably the, the best way to do it. There are other ways, depending on what your skill with your software programs are. Also, it's crooked. You think I didn't notice that? It's been driving me crazy for, um, you know, an hour now. Um, and But we can't straighten it because we need this. Um, but what we're going to do is clip it, just like we used some clipping mask on the other, um, on our business card project. Let's refer back to this. We just want, we just need to go past uh, the UIC uh, forum and then um, th the rest of the limits are pretty straightforward. So uh, with that aerial base layer current, I'm going to draw a rectangle that approximates the limits of what I want. And it's something along the lines of this. I believe. Now, as I told you before, it'll work like this. I don't need to change this rectangle at all, but just while I'm demonstrating what a clipping mask does, I'm going to make it look like a picture frame, just so you just so you see what's happening. And so this red rectangle represents the picture frame. I only want to see this image within that red rectangle. Again, doesn't matter what this rectangle looks like. I could have used the filled black thing because it's going to disappear when I do this command. Uh, but this helps you really clearly see the limits if you wanted to adjust it. You know, it's easier to do that when you can actually see what's in it. Okay, to make a clipping mask, select both entities, the object you want to clip and the mask. Just right click and make clipping mask. And there you have it. So there's our base map for, um, for this. And let's see, um, what else can I do? I'm going to unlock everything. And I'm going to, actually, I'm going to turn off everything except the gray buildings. And I'm going to select them, give them a little bit of a darker gray because they sort of need that. And here's when I've drawn everything. Mind you, I obviously haven't drawn everything yet. Um, that's when I'm going to add the drop shadow. Let's pretend that I drew everything. Um, there's a couple of things that I... I want to do globally after everything's drawn, but not before you do the annotation. The annotation you're going to do last. Annotation is not like drawing. It's, it's really not. It's something that has to, uh, has to has its own sort of rules. If the whole thing was a little too small on the page or a little too small or a little too big on the page, I could select all of it and very easily, holding down shift of course, make it a little larger or a little smaller. So draw the whole thing in, and then at the end, when you do a couple of labels, see how it's going to fit. And I'm doing this thing where I always freeze everything, and then it's much easier to, um, you know, deal globally with with um, these types of entities. Um, okay, so you may have to do a few labels and then adjust, and uh, sort of see where you are. Um, also, there's a title. So that's maybe like, I don't know, half an inch or so. It's quite big. Um, let's change that font size to like half an inch would be something along the uh, lines of 36. Let's see what that looks like. That's even a little too small, I think. OK, 
down a little more. It's a little bigger than that. Really big, really bald. Love it. It's not quite an inch. Let's go. Let's take it to like 52. See how that sits. Uh, we're going to make this color red. It's bright red. We're going to make this also not light, but heavy. And that's getting there. It's certainly the design intent is there of the page. Um, I'm doing this kind of quick. You're, and so it's a little crappy. You're going to have some time. Let's try Ariel just for the hell of it since we're bothering. Oh, I'm sorry. It's called East Side. <laughs> east Side. No wonder it's not matching. I got the wrong words. Got to use your words. All right. And it looks like the color is not carmine red but possibly this sort of oxblood red and that's looking a little more like it right um, okay this is bigger but the page is bigger so let's see let's see can I actually compare 75 um, so that's about no, that's a little small that's about right uh, but that's the process and it's it's not complicated but you have to stay organized and it's going to take some time to do all this drawing absolutely it's going to take some time to do all this drawing so um, that's what you want to do you're trying to match this as exactly as possible uh, and that's really all there is to it next video i'm going to tackle page two and then the final video page three uh, thanks for watching and just write me if you have any questions